Um, my name is Pete Raymond. I'd like to welcome you here to Yale FES. Um, I'm a faculty member and I'm uh, leading the climate initiative, which is um, something that came out of our strategic plan that our Dean Indy Burke um, led over last year. Um, today, the Yale program on climate change communications together with the Pulitzer Center is hosting a conversation on an article that came out in the New York Times over the summer, which I'm assuming all of you have read. Um, the, the article covered uh, what we knew about climate change in the 80s and how close we came to taking national action on what we knew. Um, part of my own research focuses on understanding greenhouse gases fluxes uh, globally and regionally. Um, and there's still a lot of work to do on this front. Um, however, um, it's clear that our understanding of the risks in science um, is at a point where we should, be, we should have had national action uh, a long time ago now. So this pursuit of understanding why more action hasn't been taken um, is both um, important and interesting, and FES is really happy to help further this conversation here today. Um, our moderator today is Tony Lacerowitz. Tony is the director of the YPCC and a senior research scientist here at FES. He did his undergraduate at Michigan State and got an MS and PhD from the University of Oregon. He's published over 60 articles in leading journals on factors that influence uh, public opinion and public engagement around the idea of cl around climate change. The YPCCC also publishes a number of reports. Um, and you might know it, but you've also probably also heard Tony on the radio in the morning as he does a daily um, um, program called Climate Connections. Um, his work is supported by a number of foundations, including the MacArthur Foundation, um, and government agencies such as the National Science Foundation. And just last year, he won um, the Friend of the Planet Award from the National Center for Science and Education. Um, they only gave me a couple of minutes to introduce Tony. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Tony's a scholar. He's also very passionate about what he does and a very engaging speaker. Um, so we're really lucky he to have him here today um, to moderate this interesting session. Can we give him a hand? Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, oh, I should turn on my technology. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? How about now? Yeah. There we go. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Pete, for the invitation uh, or the introduction today. And thank you all so much for coming on a rainy day. At least it's not a blazing hot day. Um, and coming all the way uh, here to Kroon Hall to join us for this really interesting conversation. Um, as Pete mentioned, I'm a faculty member here at the school uh, and director of a new center that we are launching this fall uh, called the Yale uh, Environmental, uh, sorry, the Yale Center for Environmental Communication. And this is one of our kickoff events. So we're really excited about this new initiative and I just want to give you a little bit of background about what this is going to be. So this center is going to have four key missions. First, conducting world-class research on environmental communication, really building on the foundations of the Yale program on climate change communication, really trying to understand how do mass societies respond or not respond to these critical environmental issues. Um, but secondly, teaching and training courses for both our students here and for working professionals who are uh, trying to get action on many of these issues uh, out there in the real world, so to speak. Third, we want to serve as a critical no node for an expanding network of uh, environmental communication scholars and practitioners. And then most relevant to today, uh, directly engaging the public in environmental science, stories, and solutions through a whole variety of really amazing uh, projects that we have here. So in particular, our award-winning online environmental magazine, Yale E360 our student-run environmental film festival here at Yale, which is one of the world's uh, and one of the nation's best. Uh, two student publications, Sage Magazine and the Yale Environment Review, which are great. And then, as Pete mentioned, our own Yale Climate Connections. It's our own national uh, climate change news service. We have about a dozen reporters across the United States. They're producing articles, a monthly video series, and a national radio program which you can see some of the things on our front page right this moment. Um, we've been incredibly fortunate to, 
grow this network out because we're playing twice a day on more than 400 stations across the country. And here's a, at least a pretty recent uh, version of the map. As you can see, we're pretty heavily dominated on the left and right coast. But I'm proud to say that we've got quite a bit of coverage in the middle part of the country as well. And we're trying to increasingly bring more and more attention to the south and to the Great Plains. Um, and really, the critical point I want to make here that's also part of this conversation for today is that second word in our title, and that's the word connections. We're trying to tell stories that help our listeners understand or connect the dots and understand that, first of all, climate change impacts are here and now, not distant in time and space. And secondly, and perhaps even more importantly, that climate change solutions are here and now. They're being innovated and implemented by people from every walk of life, not just presidents and prime ministers and captains of industry. People are rolling up their sleeves across this country and around the world and saying, I don't want to stand on the sidelines and watch the world burn. I want to get involved and do what I can to make a difference. So three years ago, we formed a partnership with the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting to support climate change journalism. And that includes annual events like today, uh, bringing leading environmental journalists to campus. And secondly, a competitive student fellowship program. So those students in the room, please take note. Uh, giving Yale students an opportunity to work directly with Pulitzer reporters as part of a training program in Washington, DC. And just to give our first example of the winner of this program uh, was FES student uh, Alan Shabbat, who did field research in Rwanda and wrote about the impact of climate change on the mountain gorilla and people living near its habitat. Which brings us to today. So today, we are so pleased to host Nathaniel Rich and George Steinmetz, the author and photojournalist behind this extraordinary full issue article. This was the only article in the entire issue of the magazine, <coughs> entitled Losing Earth, published by the New York Times Magazine in August, and John Sawyer, executive director of the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting. So just a few logistics here. Here's how we've organized the event. Um, to save time, we're not going to do long uh, introductions and bios. Hopefully, you all got a program, and you can see uh, how amazing everyone on this panel is by just looking at that. We'll start with a few opening remarks by John introducing this project, which the Pulitzer uh, Center supported. We'll then see a presentation by award-winning photographer George Steinmetz, who traveled the world to document the current day impacts of climate change. And then we'll hear from author Nathaniel Rich about his history of climate change science and politics in the 1980s, the critical decade when the scientific consensus was formed and the issue first reached the highest levels of national and geopolitical decision making. And then we'll have a conversation with Nat, George, and John, including Q&A with our audience here today. Uh, note that this audience has spilled out out of this room into Bowers Hall, and we actually have a fair number of people watching this live online. So for those who are watching the live stream, please know that you can submit questions at the end using the hyperlink provided on the board in Bowers Hall or in the description section of the YouTube channel. Uh, we'll try to include at least a few from our external audience. So again, thank you all so much for coming today. And now please join me in welcoming John Sawyer of the Pulitzer Center. Good evening. Thank you, Tony. Well, we're here to talk about Losing Earth, this extraordinary effort by the New York Times Magazine to bring this issue the attention it deserves, to bring home its devastating impact right now around the globe, and to explore in rich historical detail how three decades ago we blew what was likely our last best chance of fixing this problem without wrenching social, economic, and political cost. We're also here to talk about what we can do better, how we can do better on this here today. The entire Washington press corps, it seems, uh, is consumed this week with identifying the anonymous senior administration official who wrote the New York Times op-ed about attempts by him or her and others to thwart the worst instincts of President Trump. 
And never mind that we've been reading accounts of similar unnamed officials uh, with more detail for the past 18 months. The coming midterm election appears to be focused on all Trump all the time. You would be hard pressed to name a candidate anywhere in the country who is making a principal theme, the issue climate change, uh, that will be far more important than any other in determining the world in which our children and grandchildren will live. I'm reminded of the memorable passage in Nathaniel's article detailing Al Gore's leadership on climate change throughout the 1980s until 1987 when he launched a campaign for the presidency and discovered that he wasn't getting any traction talking about climate. So he dropped the issue and recast himself as an anti-abortion moderate Southern Democrat and still, by the way, lost. I'm reminded also of my own passion during those years as a reporter <coughs> writing about the dangers of proceeding with commercial nuclear power in the absence of a proven permanent solution to nuclear waste, and never really comprehending the potentially much greater risk to the entire planet of doubling down on carbon fuel instead. It wasn't just me. It seems that just about everyone, except for Jim Hansen, Rafe Pomerantz, and a few lonely others, had other priorities too, whether it was acid rain or nuclear winter or income inequality, the wars in Central America and the Middle East, uh, you name it. Our hope with losing Earth is to spark a different kind of debate, to use this combination of stunning photography and reporting with deep historical context to set off a conversation that will reach more audiences and with longer impact than the usual journalism project that is published today and subsumed tomorrow by something else. George, Nathaniel, and I will be flying out to San Francisco at the crack of dawn tomorrow, bringing this story to audiences gathered for the Global Climate Action Summit. On Wednesday, they'll be sharing the story with students at the inner city uh, Lincoln High School in San Francisco, one of several key partner schools around the country that are piloting the free online curricular materials that we built for Losing Earth and that the Times has done a great job of promoting along with us to bring people into using that, that resource. On Wednesday also, we'll be citing this project and our launch of a major new initiative aimed at promoting more and better reporting on rainforest issues around the globe. In a couple of weeks, Nathaniel will be out in Red State, Missouri, talking about this project at the University of Missouri. And the week after that, George Steinmetz will be on a panel we've organized at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, discussing the power of visual images in engaging the broad public in issues like climate change. So we've got a lot of ground to cover here today, and I think we're going to start with uh, George, as Tony said, uh, taking us on a tour of what he's done over the last year and longer uh, to illustrate the consequences of climate change all over the world right now. So, George. Can you all hear me okay? This work? Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, last June, the um, the Times um, called me up and they gave me this extraordinary opportunity. They wanted me to go and photograph the effects of climate change on every continent. And they wanted me to go and try to find the most extraordinary examples I could find. And um, it was in, in June and I had to scramble my first, uh, and I show you these uh, photos roughly in the order they were taken, but it's kind of a, 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 a global tour because I went to every continent over the past uh, 12 months. And uh, my, first, my first stop was, um, was Greenland. And this is up on the, the Greenland ice sheet, and what, this is um, in western Greenland, and those mountains you see in the background, that's the Greenland coast, so you're looking downstream. And I wanted to look at the processes that are causing the rapid glacial melt in Greenland. And um, you, this is a, a, a large, this large lake is a, is a melt pool, and last year, last winter was, um, sorry, last summer was uh, a relatively uh, cold uh, summer in, in Greenland, and the pool hadn't 
quite uh, let loose the outlet. But most people, most of the melting in Greenland is actually subglacial. It's not, uh, it's not the, the, gl the glacier is melting at the edges. And um, so th and there are these, these large systems that, that you can see that it, it flows and then there's a big moon there, which is a hole that goes down to the bottom of the glacier. And when I was some scientists from the National Science Foundation, who were trying to study the dynamics of moulins. And they, the first step was to go and set up some um, GPS locations out on the ice sheet to see how fast it was moving and how fast it was going down. Um, and these would be up all winter. There were solar panel weather stations. And then they started dropping instruments down the moulins um, so they could uh, measure the flow. And they were trying to get flow meters all the way down to the bottom of the glacier, which is here it's almost a kilometer deep. And then they ran the big experiment. I only got one pass this with my drone, but we flew out to a big moulin and they put, uh, they put red dye in the moulin to track the water flow. And this is, this is, a, very, this is a, a really cold winter. Normally this would be a, a, a torrent, but even, um, but they're trying to uh, measure the, the velocity and the, uh, the volume of the flow. very windy up there. That's why the drone's kind of bobbling around. Um, and, w and this is there. We were waiting for the, for the helicopter out. And in a typical summer, it's so warm up there, they have to move the tent every week. Otherwise, it's in, it's in a pedestal. This is, a, this is not snow. This is actually the, the, the basal ice that's melting. But this, the tent went up because it's, it's insulated from the sun. It would actually be up in a pedestal, and the wind would blow it off. Um, so the next stop was uh, for me what was, was China, and this is the um, this is the biggest coal mine in China. Uh, China consumes <laughs> roughly half of the world's coal, and it only and it supplies about sixty percent of the country's um, uh, electricity needs. This is Herwusu Mine uh, in Inner Mongolia. This is done by a, by a drone. I was about two kilometers away with my drone when I shot this. And the truck guard didn't even know I was there. Um, when you look at uh, Inner Mongolia from, from in Google Earth, you can see the, the mine, you can see the road from the mine to the power plant is a, kind of a black smear. And I followed that black smear to this huge coal sorting yard. And let me see if I can get this to run. Not running. Or I hate when that happens. And I'm sorry, but it's a, it's a video. It's a flyover. But not. I, I pushed the little middle button. It doesn't work. Well, some things work and some things don't. Good thing the drone worked. Um, so, um, if you th these are. Um, uh, 18-wheel trucks, and these are coal sorting uh, pens, so the truck drives through and it drops out the bottom, and they sort the coal into different qualities. And in the top there, that's uh, tu Tuo Ketuo. It's the, it's the biggest uh, power plant in China. It supply one power plant supplies a third of the power for Beijing. But the, the size of the, the, the hunger of, of China for coal is really quite phenomenal. Um, this is one of the biggest um, power plants in China. It's not quite as big as Tuo Ketuo. Te 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 um, uh, this supplies another big portion of Beijing's power. And the, the hunger is, you can see this night shot of Shanghai. And when you think of 1.3 billion people with rapidly rising incomes, there's an incredible demand for more, for more energy. Um, and the Chinese have done an amazing job of, of expanding their solar and nuclear uh, capacity so that the coal uh, consumption has actually plateaued. Um, but what's also quite troubling is the amount of cars. This is looking down on an interchange in China, looking at, at the bridge going to Shanghai. Let me see if I can get this one to run. Yeah, this one. And this is my drone hovering right over the center of the donut at sunset. This is an evening rush hour. But when you think, I mean, the, 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 the vehicle use has gone in car use. In, in 2009, there were 65 million cars in China. By 2020, they estimate they're going to be three times that many vehicles. And if they have as many cars per capita as they have in the United States, our, our planet's in serious trouble. Um, they also have a, a big problem with, uh, with algae. This is um, uh, Lake Kai. It's the third largest lake in China. And in the summer, with the increasing water temperatures and um, 
and a lot of agricultural runoff, uh, they get inc incredible algal blooms, which are, are very deadly for the fish, and even the, it, it messes up the, uh, the city's water supply. Shuzhou is right on the, on the shore of Lake Tai. And this, these are fish traps. And of course, there are no fish with, uh, with an algal bloom like this. It even um, clogs up this, um, this retro tourist attraction on the, sh on the shore of Lake Tai. This is on the downwind side of the lake. And this is not like fancy Photoshop. It actually looks this nasty. Um, this is the, um, the, uh, uh, the Swiss Alps, and this, this is the, the Triff Glacier in the background. It's the, one of the fastest retreating glaciers in the world. Um, I talked to Walter Luthi, who ran the little, guest, um, the little summer guest hut near here. He'd been there 20 years, and when he started, there were 30 meters of ice underneath that where that bridge is today. They used to be able to walk across that chasm, and now you, they've put a footbridge in because no one could get across. Um, and I, all the photos I had found, even just a few years ago, the ice was down at this level. And they estimate that by the end of this century, it'd only be 10% of, of the glacial ice left in the Swiss Alps. This is a, a flyover from the Triff Bridge. Now, actually, the bridge has become kind of a tourist attraction because it's a little bit, it takes, it's a little bit of, of a, a vertical game going across it. Um, this is, um, I was on the first helicopter into Houston um, when they opened up the skies after Hurricane Harvey. And Hurricane Harvey, in four days, it dropped basically the whole, a whole year's worth of rainfall in Houston. And there just really wasn't much place for the water to go. Um, it was even worse uh, going over towards Beaumont and Port Arthur, Texas. This is the Phillips uh, Conoco, uh, sorry, the Phillips, yeah, Phillips, I think it was Phillips Conoco Refinery um, uh, out near Beaumont. You can see the cars underwater here. And there was this incredible sheen of oil that was going off, off out into the bayou. Um, this is uh, Beaumont, Texas. Uh, one day later, Beaumont had 18 inches of rain in 18 hours. There was literally nowhere for the water to go. And this is the first day of sunny weather, the first day after the, basically after the rains had stopped. And everybody came out to, to try and check on their neighbors. All the, they, they came and used the middle of town to launch their little gym boats to try and go down streets and see if they could find people. You see a little boat going down uh, the street here. And it was amazing that usually with a flood area, you wouldn't find a, a swimming pool here because usually you think of like, you know, big sheet flows. But this is just, it was just rain with nowhere to go. Just filled up that blue pool and topped it out. So, you know, with, with you know, climate change, you have increasing temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico, which makes these super intense rain events more common. But this was, I think this is one of the most intense rain events ever recorded in the United States. Um, uh, this is in Santa Rosa, California, uh, co the Coffee Park suburb. And after many years of drought in California, there, was, there were a lot of dead trees and they had really strong winds. And the winds blew, um, uh, the power lines were swinging and blew dead branches onto the power lines that lit a fire and it swept through this um, suburb at night. And people there were very lucky to get out with their lives. It was really spooky from the helicopter, but it was even creepier walking around in the ground. Um, this is a car, it got so, the fire was so hot it melted aluminum hubs. And you can see them like, it's like pulling like candle wax, the aluminum down the street. But the entire neighbor was just was burned to the foundation. This is the um, athletic field at the local uh, Catholic school, and it burned the astroturf. You see the baseball diamond there near Pelé. Uh, and uh, this is um, the central uh, ferry terminal in Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh. And Bangladesh, like Houston, has had in increasingly intense rainstorms. Um, uh, due to increased evaporation, they have really, really strong storms, and you can see there's a, uh, at, at the, there's, a high, there's a high levee on the shore, but there's so much rain that they actually, it, it floods like a bathtub, and one of the issues they have in Bangladesh is that they, people have, have built onto the, the, old, the old channels used to, to drain into the river, and they, they built housing there, so there, there's nowhere for the, for the city to drain. And you find uh, serious flooding problems uh, in the Brahmaputra. Um, this is upstream from Dhaka. And people live for years in the really fertile soils of the river, but the flooding is making it increasingly difficult for them to, to survive there. This is just after the flood waters receded. Let me see if I can get this to play. It's not playing. Let me see if I can use this PC. 
What a bummer. It's a really nice flyover, but it's just not working. You want to try? It's a great projector. There we go. Um, the, the flood water, the people in Bangladesh have learned to live in rural areas very lightly on the land so that when they get flooded, they don't, they don't lose as much. Um, and so these little, I think everybody had, had abandoned this area during the floods and now they were just coming back. And it looks like their banana trees had made it, but about everything else got wiped out. And all the, uh, the vertical plants there, that's jute, which they use for, um, uh, for, for weaving into like floor mats and different kinds of, uh, of, of products. Everybody's coming out to see the drawing. It's kind of exciting for them. Um, and when you go down the delta, this is the last island in the Brown Putra Delta before you, you go out into the Indian Ocean. And this is at high tide. It's just amazing to see people growing rice right at the tide line. I mean, this is, this is seawater here, and that's freshwater rice paddy. So these people, to me, they were, they were like, the water was like up to their nostrils. They were just like barely above the water line. And when you get a, a storm surge there, you can easily see how they'd be wiped out. Um, and in the summer when the monsoon rains hit, it, the, 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 this brown water is actually fresh and everything's great, but they get a storm surge and they're, they're wiped out. And you can see how, they're li how lightly they're living in the land by the, this really kind of rickety infrastructure, to kind of just barely enough to get by and easy to put together if it got wiped out. Um, this is the ferry leading to the island. And you can see that they, that there's no, there's the terminal is the ferry terminal, is underwater as well, but that's fresh water. That, that's rice, and that's that's basically it's ocean water right against the rice. Um, I spent uh, three weeks trying to get a picture of a penguin colony in Antarctica. The Antarctic Peninsula um, has one of the uh, is one of the areas of, on Earth that has this most rapidly warming climate. Um, and one of the big issues there for, for wildlife is, is krill, um, because the, the krill, krill depends on algae that grows in the bottom of sea ice. And as the sea, this is, I was on the first boat down there in the spring, in uh, the Antarctic spring, and you can see how, how quickly it had broken up. I mean, it normally this would all be covered in ice, and it was all, it was all gone, and the glaciers were calving. And so the, the, with, less, with less sea ice, there was less krill. With less krill, there was much less wildlife. This is our... Um, our dinghy going through and doing a, uh, a survey of the, uh, of the, uh, of the ice as it was breaking up. And the penguin, the penguin this is um, uh, Deception Island, and the penguin numbers here, it was uh, extraordinary. The penguin, the penguin population had dropped. It had gone from um, 85,000 in 2003 to 55,000 in, in 2016 because they were basically they were starving to death because of lack of krill. So all the chin straps, they come down, they leave the, one of the mating couples leaves the other on the nest and the other comes down to, to get fish and they're up ready to launch to try and find some, some krill to eat. Um, this is in um, Southwest uh, Australia near Perth and the, the agriculture line, the, the line between like farmland and ranch land has moved 100 miles towards the sea in the last 20 years due to um, due an increasingly warm climate. And these are saline lakes, they're, they're red with algae, um, but the, the, all the, the wheat fields are all salting up and becoming less and less farmable. Um, and this is not far away, this is in, in, in Shark Bay in Western Australia, and Shark Bay has, has uh, rapidly warming uh, water that's killing all the seagrass, it's critical habitat for dugong and other marine mammals. You see some divers there from the University in Perth who are doing a survey of the, uh, of the seagrass. So they've had, they've had huge um, uh, kind of heat waves in the marine water there. They're killing all the seagrass. Uh, and this is in uh, Mauritania on the edge of the Sahara. This is a, an ancient caravan town called Chinguetti. It's a, started in the, in the 12th century. And Chinguetti is slowly getting buried by sand due to increased sandstorms caused by climate change. Um, this is a, a flyover of Chinguetti. Let's see if this, uh, this doesn't want to work. Let's see, let's see if it gets to work. Yeah, it works. They've had um, uh, about three feet of sand deposited through sandstorms in the past 15 years. And it, it, it collapses the mud walls.
And even in fact, see, this is, this is the, the, the gardens of Chinguetti, and here the gardens are getting buried in sand. The, the sandstorms come in from the left side of the picture, and they put sand fences into the sand trying to stabilize the dune field so the uh, date palms don't get buried. Uh, this is the capital of Mauritania. Mauritania has had severe droughts for the past 20, 30 years. Now 30% of the country's population lives in the capital, and on the outskirts, they're getting buried in sand as well. You see here in the lower left, that's, um, oops, uh, that's the water truck. It comes once a week, and you get, you get 50, uh, 50 liters of water for your family. And uh, the last place I went on my project was the Amazon, and the Times is holding on to that material potential use in a future article. But I wanted, I've, I've worked in the Amazon over the past few years, and I wanted to. To me, the Amazon is really critical because it's like the, it's the, the, the lungs of our planet. And this is the Amazon on fire. Um, I spent 15 hours flying over the Amazon in a small plane looking for deforestation in the, um, in the dry season. And the fires have been set as the, as the very start of the deforestation process. And this is a, an area in Pará State that's been cleared for cattle. And this area was cleared for farming. All that's left are th is, a, is a little bit of a, a margin along the river, which is by, by Brazilian law, you can't, you can't clear all the way to the water's edge. And you also can't cut down Brazil nut trees. But with uh, the roots drying in the dry season, the Brazil nut trees don't live very long this way. This is a, a legal uh, logging operation. And legal logging is still continuing in, in the Amazon. Um, and they're clearing all the valuable trees. And after they do that, it will be uh, clear cut for, uh, for farmland. The log yard. I went out with the bomb of the um, Brazilian um, forestry police in an armed helicopter. We landed there and checked with their checked their permits, which they did not have. Um, and this is, shows the different phases of deforestation. The Amazon. They after they they take out the valuable timber and they burn it. They come through with massive bulldozers connected by an anchor chain and they pull it down. It's kind of like shaving the forest. And that's what you see these these piles of, of logs here. And you can see the tracks of the, of the dozers. And then they'll burn that again, and they'll plant soybeans and corn. And in northern Mato Grosso province, they have a real sweet spot for agriculture. They can get two crops on the same land um, without any irrigation. So even if you get caught for illegal deforestation, you just make so much money on farming that it doesn't really matter. This is the, the soybean harvest on the edge of the Amazon. When I was flying my paraglider here, this was a few years ago, I was flying paragliders, not drones. but. I saw macaws flying through the forest. You still had intact forest along this river margin. And this is the biggest uh, grain port at Santos in Brazil. And um, virtually all the, the grain here was going to China. This is the main grain port uh, for soybeans in the Yangtze River. So anyway, more to come. Thank you. Glad to be here. I want to warn, uh, apologize. I have a cough, and I don't because I'm mic'd. I don't know how to cough and not <laughs> explode your eardrums. So, it might just happen a few times. Um, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, my editors at the Times asked if I'd like to write an entire issue-length piece about climate change. It'd be the second iteration of a partnership with the Pulitzer Center, begun a year earlier with Fractured Land, Scott Anderson's story about the Middle East. The idea appealed to me, but only, and my editors felt the same way, if we could figure out how to write about this subject in a new way. After all, the dominant mode of climate change writing for a general audience has become, over the years, uh, pretty well established. Like any common narrative, it's developed its tropes and cliches. I characterize the basic template as something like this. Here's some new disaster. Trump is undoing a regulation, dropping out of Paris, calling for more coal power. This is a big problem because the world is getting warmer, and if we don't limit warming to two degrees Celsius or one and a half degrees, some really scary things will come to pass in the decades ahead. But already you can see the effects, wildfires, drought, flooding, superstorms. 
The political and economic powers that be are aligned against us, the oil and gas industry, the Republican Party, campaign finance law, capitalism itself. Yet there's still time to avoid the worst if only we take action now, uh, whether that be holding Exxon accountable, uh, protesting at Standing Rock, voting for democratic socialists, or what have you. Now all of this is valid and I don't take issue with any of it, but it's remarkable how consistent the message is. It's undergirded by an activist impulse which simpl simplified would read, it's not too late if only we act now. That's true too, but is it the whole story? I don't think it is, which is how we came upon the idea of writing a story about the decade between 1979 and 1989 when the fundamental scientific questions were settled beyond debate and attention turned from diagnosis of the problem to policy solutions. It was also crucially a time before the oil and gas industry had consolidated behind a strategy of disinformation propaganda, buying off scientists, politicians, and an entire political party to thwart any serious effort to reduce carbon emissions, and ultimately to propagate the clownish fantasy of climate denialism. It was a decade when major figures within the Republican Party made strong good faith efforts to push for action before anti-environmentalism became a central tenet of Republicanism. It was during this time that a practical solution was also first articulated, a global treaty to curb carbon emissions modeled after the successful ozone treaty. It was, in other words, a time not only before our political paralysis had taken hold, but before the public conversation had undergone its own form of paralysis. Over the course of 18 months, I read whatever I could find about the period, academic theses, newspaper and magazine articles, congressional testimony, government reports. I spent weeks visiting archives, the National Archive in Washington, the Reagan Library, Roger Revelle's papers at UCSD, several private collections. I interviewed more than 100 people, <clears throat> former senators, congressional staffers from both sides of the aisle, scholars, scientists inside and outside of government, bureaucrats, environmental activists, oil and gas industry operatives and scientists, several high-ranking members of the American Petroleum Institute, journalists, psychologists, economists, social theorists. The most surprising thing about my research was the discovery that every single conversation we're having today in 2018 about climate change was being held nearly verbatim in 1980. I don't mean only the predictions about degrees of warming and sea level rise, uh, natural disasters and geopolitical tensions but also conversations about the need to help developing nations increase energy consumption without resorting to massive extraction of coal and petroleum, geoengineering, removing carbon from the atmosphere, and the cost-benefit analysis that always seems to favor inaction. In the end, I settled on a narrative focused primarily on the two figures I felt were most responsible for moving the issue forward during those years, for nearly convincing the U.S. to take decisive action while there was still time. Rafe Pomerantz, a political lobbyist for Friends of the Earth and the World Resources Institute, and James Hansen, the director of NASA's Goddard Institute. Their campaign can be broken down into three phases. In the first, from 1979 to 1981, they believed that it would be enough simply to share what they knew with those who occupied the highest seats of power, that the size of the threat would move prudent officials to act. So Jim Hansen published his shocking scientific findings in journals, major scientific journals, and gave interviews to the New York Times. And Ray Pomerantz organized a series of high-level meetings at various branches of the federal government, including EPA, uh, Department of Energy, National Security Council, and the White House. At these meetings, Gordon McDonald, a senior scientist who informally was considered the chief scientist to the CIA, and was very alarmed about the issue, explained the nature of the threat and advocated for major policy to remedy it. When this approach failed, they tried to bring their warnings to the public through the press, largely fueled by congressional hearings. Later, they turned to their most desperate gambit yet, a tactic of public shaming, which reached its finest expression during the summer of 1988, the hottest on record, during which the U.S. was plagued by historic droughts and fires, when Hansen told the world to stop waffling on global warming and take action. Hansen's testimony had a major effect on public opinion and support for a treaty, but obviously not enough. In November 1989, thanks to the determined opposition of President Bush's Chief of Staff, John Sununu, 
the U.S. declared it would not sign any binding treaty to reduce carbon emissions. We haven't come as close to a solution since. Why did we fail then when most of the obstacles now in our way had yet to present themselves? The narrow political answer is Sununu. He won a heated policy debate within the Bush White House, beating out Jim Baker, Bush's Secretary of State, and then William Riley, Bush's EPA Administrator. But it's hardly a satisfying answer. It raises, in fact, a different question. Why was public support for a treaty so weak that it took a single naysayer within the Bush administration, albeit one who, cons who held considerable power, to thwart the prospect of a binding global treaty to reduce emissions? A small group of social scientists had debated since the mid-'70s if a human solution to this human problem was even possible. Whether they came at the question from the vantage of political science or economics or psychology, they tended to conclude that human beings did not have sufficient reverence for the long-term future to motivate the level of immediate transformational change required to solve the climate crisis. Adaptation, as the philosopher Klaus Meyer Ebik concluded at the time, seems to be the most rational political option. I don't think any discussion of the issue uh, Sorry, I do think any discussion of the issue needs to take into account our general discomfort in, in engaging with long-term threats, especially those that are existential in nature. But we have solved, or at least endeavored more seriously to solve other pressing social issues. This brings me back to the question of how we tend to write about climate change. We know by now the political story, the technology story, the economic story, the industry story. Those are all critical to understanding how we got here. But what about the human story? How do we live with the knowledge that the future will be far less hospitable to human civilization than the present? How do we make sense of the complicity of our governments, our corporations, and ourselves in all of this? What does it say about who we are as a people, as a society, as a democracy? Will future generations be satisfied with the answers that we now offer for inaction? And even as we consider solutions today, how do we understand our failures to this point? These are just some of the moral questions that have not been deeply considered <clears throat> on a broad public level. I don't think as a culture that we've articulated a moral framework for how we think about climate change. Yet we speak in moral terms about all the other great issues of the day. Think of gay marriage or gun violence, especially with the school shootings. Uh, immigration, as you've seen with the family separation policy, even the accelerating uh, rate of mechanization. Major social changes tend to be powered by a sense of moral purpose. The major transformations that are now required to end our dependence on fossil fuel consumption over a brief amount of time will require such a shift in consciousness. It's not enough to appeal to self-interest, even people who have no reason to believe that they will be harmed by wildfires or rising sea levels must demand change out of a higher sense of duty to one's fellow human beings. I don't doubt that we'll ultimately summon the will to take decisive action. The question is whether we do so because the suffering is, so, is already so flagrant that we have no other choice, or whether enough people understand that when we talk about things like, say, fuel efficiency standards, or solar ba power, battery technology, or enhancing public transit networks, we're talking about nothing less than the fate of civilization, all we love and all we are. <clears throat> Thank you. Good. All right. Well, thank you uh, uh, for everything just there. So we've got a lot on the table and uh, a lot of big things to think about and talk about here. Um, let me begin actually with George. Um, so just to get us started here, this was really an incredible assignment that you were given. Uh, you were given the opportunity to uh, well, and you have traveled the globe as a photographer for National Geographic, Geo Magazine from Germany. Uh, you've had this incredibly rare opportunity to explore and experience the world in a way that almost no other human beings on this planet ever have. Um, 
This, however, was a unique assignment um, focused on documenting the impacts of climate change. And really, the photographs that you brought back are stunning. Um, and so with all respect to Nathaniel and his writing, um, I'd argue that it's probable that your images are what most readers are going to remember years from now. Um, so I'm wondering, first of all, what did you learn from this experience that you didn't already know, having certainly learned and known about climate change for a long time, but having traveled to every continent on this planet to investigate and document this story, how did it change your own understanding, your, in your bones, your own understanding of this issue? I think the most, um, I mean, uh, it, 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 it's, I think it's most affecting when it's in your own backyard. And it was, um, I'm a native Californian, and when I walked through these um, burned out neighborhoods in, in California, the uh, kind of tracked homes and little cul-de-sacs, and just saw places burned to the foundation, it was, it was really stark. And, and, um, and uh, I went to, my, my, my drone crashed that morning. <laughs> we kind of augured in. And so I went to like ship it out FedEx to get it fixed. And I, the FedEx guy like lived in that neighborhood. And, and I ended up talking to him about, you know, how he barely got out, like how, how he heard the, the bombs of, of like barbecues, um, the barbecue uh, tanks were like exploding. So it woke him up. Wow. And then it's like his dog was barking. But they came in at like, you know, two in the morning and just, and in California, we've had numerous droughts, but the drought they were going had been through in the previous few years was very severe. And it was a combination of things that, that caused that. When it's your own, when it's your own neighborhood, your own people. I mean, I'm used to going through, you know, I've been through refugee camps in Somalia, and, it, and it's heartbreaking. But when it's your own backyard, mm. it, it's much more uh, affecting. Yeah. So that's a perfect segue then, because my next question is really about the kind of photography that you do, and. This actually relates to a new course that we just started here at Yale uh, today that's looking at perspectives on the Anthropocene, this biggest story of our time, of essentially how do we, as a population of probably nine <coughs> to 10 billion, live on a single planet without breaking the life support systems on which we all depend, getting to some of the big narratives that you were just raising. Um, and I'm really struck by, first of all, the power of photography, which we've known now for years. I mean, David Brower, you know, pioneered the environmental coffee table book because he knew how powerful those images would be in shaping public opinion and, and galvanizing action. Um, what you've really brought, because of this new technology, both from your prior work in helicopters and ultralights, but now with drones, you're giving us a different perspective on these issues than we usually have. Usually the picture is at the ground level, looking at a person who's maybe had their home destroyed, so on. I mean, so much of the TV footage, for example, tends to focus on that level. You're bringing us up above all of that. Um, you know, a bird's eye view, even a god's eye view, if you will. How do you think that plays? How does that shape the perspective of the viewer as they try to get their head around these issues? Well, I, I think it really helps because you, you, what I love to do is get a, a picture just kind of a little bit above the ground so you can see something kind of personally you can relate to, whether it's like a overflowing swimming pool or a uh, you know, some melted cars, and then you see the expanse of it in the background. It's the two of that, something kind of that's relatable. Yeah. And then the, the magnitude, I think, is really powerful. And, um, you know, this, this technology, that I'm not a, a geek, but this drone technology is a really uh, amazing tool. And I couldn't, um, I couldn't have done a, a lot of what I did without it. And even getting into, let's say, like, well, getting into, like, a coal mine in China, um, uh, without official permission, shall we say? I was going to um, ask and, that and, question. And, uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, like the, the, the I, nobody really even knew I was there. Yeah. Um, it, it was really quite extraordinary. It really opens up new possibilities. So I'm not really into the geek. I'm into what the, the, these things can do, mm. and, and it, it, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's pioneering a whole new form of photography. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So uh, then uh, to Nathaniel. Um, so this is an incredibly rich piece, and I'll just say, as someone who really kind of came to political awareness in the 1980s, it was an incredible experience to go back into those days and really realize how much was going on at the time. Um, and for those that haven't read it, uh, let me just give you a quick uh, a summary. So um, in the 1980s, the scientific community had reached consensus. The fossil fuel industry had not yet started its de climate denial propaganda campaign. There were at least a few Republicans in Congress who had even sponsored climate legislation. 
And as you document, during the 1980s, climate change went from being largely unknown to a global geopolitical issue. Um, and yet the United States and the world failed to act and have continued to fail to act. Um, and your narrative largely focuses around and circulates around these two heroes, Rafe uh, Pomerantz and Jim Hansen, who made enormous sacrifices in their own life over that decade to bring climate change to the world's attention. You also identify these two critical moments, it seems, in that time period when key leaders acted to delay or, uh, or derail climate action. And you mentioned one. Um, but I'm hoping you can unpack that a little bit for us. Because the first was by a man named William Nirenberg, who was chair of the first comprehensive review of climate change science by the National Academy of Sciences in 1983 which was a pretty strong, comprehensive report that had pulled together stuff that had been out there for a while, but it was a very authoritative panel. The top people in the country were part of it, and it was uh, a critical, seminal moment uh, uh, in this. And yet, he himself publicly undermined the conclusions of his own report by publicly saying after it was published that actually climate change wasn't that urgent of a problem and we could probably just adapt our way around it. Why? Um, and then the second related is the one that you talked about, and that's um, Sununu, John Sununu, who was chief of staff to President H.W. Bush, uh, and I'll say with an assist from Yale's own Alan Bromley, uh, who was then science advisor to President Bush, uh, blocked international action in 1989. So yes, your, your question is a good one. Why wasn't public opinion strong enough to overcome these barriers, but at the same time, these men did fundamentally delay and derail uh, uh, action at the time. Why? So, <clears throat> in there had been, I guess, to give a little background to changing climate report, the changing climate report, there had been a series of major um, government reports about climate change um, beginning in the '70s, uh, and. Uh, a couple that I talked about in the piece are the Charney Report in 1979, which essentially has the, the function of establishing scientific consensus. There's a follow-up report that reviews the Charney Report a couple years later in the, the Schelling Report. Um, and Schelling was a major um, architect of nuclear Cold War theory, uh, game theory. And he then was part of Nirenberg's effort, which was another National Academy of Sciences effort, comprehensive the first comprehensive treatment of climate change. So it wasn't simply like the Charney report, um, you know, how much will the world warm if carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere doubles, um, but how will this affect basically every aspect of life? What are the causes? Um, what could be done? And what are the, the soci socio-political impacts? And so Reagan took office in 81 and basically, there was this kind of um, nightmarish moment for the environmental movement as he very ra took all of these radical measures to stop the environmental progress, uh, legislative progress that had been happened over um, really decades. Uh, and that first knocked, that was, I would say, even before changing climate, knocked the, the, the climate change movement, uh, for lack of a better term, off its heels because people like Rafe Pomerantz were no longer had the luxury to, to think about uh, global warming when they were worried about um, the EPA stopping to function um, or Department of Energy, you know, being closed down and so on. So the answer that the that the administration gave during all of this time was about climate change was we need to wait till the changing climate report is published uh, and that will tell us what we and we'll follow the advice of that. So it had a lot of significance. Um, and so it's a 600-page report, which you can read online uh, now. And it basically, comprehensive, and it basically didn't change anything about the, the scientific, the science of the problem. Uh, it confirmed the findings of, of the Charney Report and many others. Um, and yet, the gloss that on it, given by Nirenberg, and also, I should say, Roger Revelle, who was, one of, was, was, was on the committee with Nirenberg, as one of the leading figures to bring the attention of the public to, to global warming back in the, starting in the 50s, um, was essentially that these are very bad problems, and yet 
our position should be one of caution, not panic. And we should wait to develop solutions, uh, technological solutions particularly. And so, yes, I found this mystifying. Other people have written about this before. Naomi Oreskes has written about it um, as well. And, and I spoke with a lot of people on that committee who worked, Nirenberg's dead. Um, but I looked at the papers of the committee at, at uh, UCSD uh, in Roger Revelle's special collection. Um, and I looked, and I spoke with, with you know, his, his assistants and secretaries on it. And basically, <clears throat> the, the, the explanation that I got from everybody, including all the people who spoke with Oreskes, was that there was a real generational battle that was going on within the scientific community at the time, where you had a whole generation of senior scientists with enormous influence in, in, in uh, the federal government, which is also something that I think is hard for people now to wrap their minds around, that there was this kind of priestly class of scientists uh, that emerged from the Manhattan Project originally and then had been key top advisors to every president until Reagan, basically, um, who were advising on, on every major issue of, of uh, national security and social policy. Nirenberg was part of that, Ravel was part of that, Gordon MacDonald was part of that. And a lot of these guys, especially Nirenberg, had come of age in the Depression. Uh, they had been, Nirenberg himself was part of the Manhattan Project. They had had this very strong belief in technology to cure our ills. Um, there was a sense that if we could win the war, if we could invent the A-bomb, if we could get out of the Great Depression, um, through the wonders of science and mathematics, then surely this carbon dioxide problem, as, as scary as it might seem now to you young people, um, we will be able to do so in time. And the amount of the reorganization of the kind of economic uh, system of the, of the world, uh, if we take action ahead of time right now, um, would be too disruptive to justify the possible benefits. And so it was, it was a reinterpretation of the, you know, of, and he was a guy, grew up in South Carolina, you know, he was part of the generate, he was a Reagan voter, he was part of that whole community. So he had a kind of, there was a Republican political aspect to it, but nobody I spoke to, as much as I tried, said that he was at all influenced politically, directly by the White House. If anything, he had gotten into a fight with the White House when they tried to stop the, the report earlier. And so it was basically, the, the best answer I could get was that it came down to a kind of generational difference, a difference in the optimism about the future, uh, optimism in the uh, wisdom of the sort of political elders to solve great problems. That, that I think the younger group, the sort of Vietnam vet generation that Ray Pomerantz was part of, didn't share. Um, Sununu is just a, a bizarre, his own case. Um, he, I, you know, I, I spoke with him at length. He's very proud of his role in uh, disrupting all of this. He's still a skeptic about the science. Um, and he came to his scientific skepticism independently. Uh, he was a mechanical engineer, PhD. He had done some computer modeling for, for engineering. He, and he, the computer modeling that a lot of the, cli the climate projections were based on, he didn't buy because the res I mean, uh, for various technical reasons that uh, lots of climate scientists have assured me are complete gobbledygook. Um, but he stood by that and he also saw this sort of sinister, he had this theory of, of a sinister cabal of, of environmentalists with um, anti-growth forces, um, and, and he was determined to, to try to stop this as, as much as he could. So what's interesting in particular, for, again, for our students who are gonna be dealing with these exact things is in the case of Nuremberg, you've got this fundamental shift, this conflict actually in worldview between this kind of Promethean view of humans can control nature, we can make it do what we want, right? We can solve all problems, uh, which came out of that experience of cracking the atom and you know, building the Hoover Dam and, you know, the interstate system and winning World War II and, and so on. I mean, it seemed like at, for those mostly men, uh, we could do anything. So uh, 
And then, as you said, in the late 60s and 70s is the rise of this, particularly the environmental sciences, which are beginning to call into question so many of those assumptions. Um, they see that, in fact, there are enormous unintended consequences of which things like Three Mile Island and so on really kind of brought home, is that this modernist technological uh, uh, civilization that we were building had lots of unintended consequences yeah. that were harming the planet and, and people. Um, okay, so uh, I know we have at least uh, Dan Esty is somewhere in the crowd and hopefully, okay, great. Uh, so Dan is one of our professors <coughs> and actually participated at this time uh, at the EPA and uh, Dan, I'd like to give you the first question. Oh, wow. Uh, in the office outside of the EPA and uh, trying to move this issue forward. And I think you've captured it. I'm not wasting much of your credit, but I think the piece that I want to push you on, and frankly, it was uh, enthusiastic, a, a lover story about a Republican party that itself had two visions to shut down uh, and was so violently pushing very aggressive pushes for action. Uh, Bob Grady, who was in the uh, House of Management and Budget, pushing. Yeah, um, I, I guess fr first I would say about Darman, who's, who's dead. Uh, my, from talking to Sununu and others and Riley, um, my sense was that Darman certainly was on Sununu's team, as was Alan Bromley, a Yale nuclear physicist, um, but that Sununu was the engine that pushed them both. Um, <coughs> but uh, yeah, I spoke a lot with Riley and a lot of, you know, Repu you know uh, Dern Senator Dernberger during this time, a Republican from Minnesota who was very active on the issue. There are a few senators who are deceased, uh, Chafee and Stafford, were very powerful, very strongly pushing these issues then. And of course, if you look at, if you look at these letters that were being sent to Reagan and Bush during the decade from, from the Senate urging strong policy, it's majority Democrat, but you'll have a dozen to 20 or so Republican senators putting their signature on these, these lists. And it's a wing of the party that doesn't seem to exist at all now. Um, and as to, I think there is a strong conservative argument for uh, global warming, for climate policy. I think that, that it's essentially, um, in the long term, we know from all of these studies, it, it's economically prudent. It's a conservative decision to, to uh, protect our resources over the long term. Um, we should not be, um, you know we, that there's that there's conservative values in in um, preserving the environment, preserving the natural world, um, the world that we've been given. Uh, these were arguments that were made. I mean, I quote in the piece from from an, a speech um, given by a, a Republican former member of the CEQ, um, Malcolm Forbes Baldwin, laying this out to some extent. But nobody makes those dis those arguments or anything like those anymore in the Republican Party. Um, I don't, but you know, look, a lot, of, a lot of what was the old Republican Party is gone. It's not just this. Um, the party is unrecognizable from what it was during this period that I wrote about. Um, 
So <clears throat> is it, I guess your question is, is it possible that they'll come around? I mean, I, I think it is. I just don't, I don't know that it'll be called the Republican Party. I think it might be something else. Uh, I mean, that's sort of a broader question about where's, where's the Republican Party post-Trump? And it's, I, I don't wanna start going out a, on a limb on that, but, but I, d this does feel to me like the, the death throes of a movement, and I think something else will come on to replace it that will be a, a, apart from what we think of as the Democratic Party. Okay, other questions? Uh, let's go with right here, Mary Ethelyn Tucker. Uh, if you could just wait for the microphone. Um, thank you so much, Nate and George and <coughs> John for helping this and Tony for hosting it. Um, I was so glad, uh, I'm Mary Evelyn Tucker and with my husband we have a project here on world religions and ecology and uh, I'd love for you to comp pick up on your last point because I think it's so true and I think you really nail it when you say we don't have the moral and ethical perspective for these issues. We've got science, we've got economics, we've got policy, we've got incredible photography <coughs> and so on. Um, and it seems as though right this week in California there's gonna be a lot on this issue with the uh, Brown Climate Summit, especially at Grace Cathedral. And Pope Francis's encyclical is clearly a, a massive way forward. But we've been working with seminaries on this issue they're still locked into a human-centered ethics. So we're trying to bring this, you know, to expand this with the different world religions. But I'd love for you and anyone else to uh, comment on that because it's so crucial. And John maybe can add to it um, as well. Yeah, I, I would say the person that has most effectively articulated that argument is, is the Pope in his encyclical. I think that's the, the <clears throat> best example that I know of a major a uh, public figure making a moral argument for action that goes beyond the, the politics of it. Um, I don't know if it was, you know, who in the States was persuaded by it, um, but it does seem to me that there need to be <coughs> more figures like that to come forward. Um, you need, a kind, you need kind of a Martin Luther King of this movement, and I don't think we have one yet, and um, that the appeal has to go sort of above and below the politics in order to generate the kind of public um, effort and demand for, for really major, the major action that we, we need. All the Jesuit universities in the world are picking up the encyclical despite the, the, the bishops who aren't so interested. That's interesting, yeah. So uh, I can at least reference that in that we actually did a study on the impact of the Pope's encyclical mm. and visit to the United States and we actually have a report on our website mm. you're welcome to come look oh, at called The Francis you. Effect. Oh. because we found that there was an effect. Um, not the encyclical itself, because as great of a work as it is, and I encourage everyone to read it, um, although it was written by the Pope, he doesn't pontificate. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually a really great uh, cl instant classic. Um, but believe it or not, people didn't line up outside bookshelves like the latest Harry Potter book to read the encyclical. Um, it was his visit to the United States, which was covered 24-7 by your profession, the news media, and when he was in front of the White House, he <coughs> talked about climate change as a moral issue. When he spoke before a joint session of Congress, he talked about climate change as a moral issue. When he spoke in front of the United Nations, he spoke about climate change as a moral issue. And in every single event he went to, he talked about it. And as a result, Americans heard a framing of climate change that they had frankly never heard before which is that, wait a second, this has something to do with morality, with ethics, with my religious beliefs, huh? Isn't this just about polar bears? But critically, <coughs> that has to be continued. Right. In fact, I, I was invited to the Vatican a couple years ago and that was my message. So you have to keep talking because we forget. We forget in today's cycle within 24 hours. Um, and so how does this conversation continue? Um, and I'd like to pick up on uh, her point and really say, and now that I'm going big picture here, because when you were describing the dominant narratives that most climate journalism falls into, and I think you're right, um, I would even say it's even further, it's environmental storytelling period, has generally been one, and I don't mean to overemphasize <coughs> this, but one of dystopia, okay? Uh, and I don't want to overframe it in religious terms because it's not religious, but it has this character of repent 
and change your ways or we're going to end up in this future hell that we're depicting. And now we can even see the early signs of it. Okay? What we don't seem to have done is told an opposing story. The story of actually the sustainable world that we actually want to live in. Um, and that's a huge cultural vacuum. And it's a vacuum that people like Rush Limbaugh are more than happy to fill themselves with. They say he's so, he's so beautiful in the way he says things. You know, uh, environmentalists want to take away your car, they want to take away your home, they want you to live naked and shivering in the caves. I mean, <laughs> I don't know anybody. Anybody here want to live like that? Um, I don't know anybody who says that. And yet we don't have that clear vision of the world that we actually want to live in that, by the way, isn't just better than the hell we're describing, but is actually better than the hell that many people are living in today. Because this current system ain't working so great either. So this is really a big question for any of you to try to address. What's the role of journalism in telling that kind of a story? Well, I think part of the challenge uh, for journalists is what you're saying. You have this repetition, this engagement. You have to be out. You have to sort of, you know, you have to reach different audiences. And I think one of the traps that we and the media have fallen in, and particularly with the era of Trump, it's the us versus them. It's the it's it's preaching to your own choir. And we, you know, for years we talked about Fox and how bad Fox was, that it was a distortion, that it wasn't true journalism. And yet, looking, you know, I, I, would, I make my coffee to, to MSNBC, the Morning Joe, and that is about as distorted on the, the other way as, as Fox is to the right. And, and it is just as self-contained and within a, within a bubble. And so when we started having conversations with Jake Silverstein and his colleagues at the New York Times about doing this project 18 months or so ago, and it became our, the biggest project that we've done in the last year or so at the Pulitzer Center. What I kept saying to him, and then when we were talking to Nathaniel about it, as we're framing, they were, they were framing the approach, was that I, our goal is not to, to make the Times subscriber audience feel good or feel bad, or feel good about feeling bad, <coughs> or reconfirming their views. and. We want to reach, we want them to do something that's going to reach beyond the Times audience and sort of create something that will actually generate conversation. So when Nathaniel started going down this road of, of the moral dimension of this and the, and the fact that, that back then, even when you had a, a much more bipartisanship, as Nathaniel just described, than we have today, that even then, under those circumstances, we couldn't uh, bring together the political will to make something happen. And, and it wasn't just because of big oil, or it wasn't just Exxon, it wasn't that Exxon knew and kept it from us, it wasn't just the Republican Party you know, being so, and, and, and it's been a fascinating debate as, as, as lots of people on the left have come after this project and, and Nathaniel's thesis, and you can speak better to this than I, than I you have been, this notion that, no, no, he got it wrong, he was much too easy, that he, that he let the Republicans and big oil off the hook. And I think if all of us just stop for a nanosecond and think about our own role of what we've done in our lives, the purchases that we've made, the consumption that we do, the, the priorities that we make, we haven't made this a priority. And so what we want to do now, is, and what we're in the course of doing, um, is take this out to as many venues as we can, and we're as interested in doing it in rural red state communities and, and finding audience in, in that part of the country as we are with, with being at places like Yale where, where we're all more or less on, on the same page. So that, in, in that sense, I think that, that the real work is beginning, and, you, and when you have resources like this and images like George has provided for us, it's a huge thing to take out and, and spark conversation. So that's what we're about. Okay. Do either of you have anything you want to add? Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know. I and mean, there are a lot of things raised there. I, I guess I would question the premise of, of a journalistic obligation to tell, to be pessimistic or optimistic. Um, that, you know, I, it, it, this is the only subject that, or, that I can think of where <clears throat> there's an expectation on the part of a writer to uh, to 
to, to motivate the, per, the reader to act in one way or another. That's not how we approach journalism about uh, race or you know, gun violence or, or any of these other major social issues. So why is there an expectation that any article written about climate change should be trying to figure out the best way to motivate people to act? I think there's value in that kind of activist uh, journalism. I think there's, there should be, it, it should exist, there should be more of it, it sh should be better. Um, but I don't see that as the responsibility of, of, of journalists um, or writers in general. Uh, that's, that I, I think there is a responsibility though to take into account some of these places where there aren't clear answers um, and where there is some moral complexity. And I think that's, that's a subject that's a terrain that really has been left unaddressed by writers of all kinds, not just journalists, um, by novelists as well. Uh, and so, yeah, you see these dystopian treatments and you sometimes see utopian treatments. And I think there's room for all of that, but I, I also think there's, there's a need, and I think the response to the piece has reflected this, uh, for a greater reckoning with, with the complexity of the issue um, and the challenges that it poses not only the tech, you know, technological challenges, but the challenges to um, the way we think about ourselves and our place in, in the world. Okay, uh, other questions? Um, well, actually, let's give a student a chance. Uh, yes, right here in the middle. <coughs> Hi, thanks. Um, I have a question for George. I was wondering how you chose the places in which to photograph and r fly your drones. Um, it seemed like you were kind of lucky, despite the unluckiness of, let's say, Houston with the flooding, um, for that to happen during the period in which you were doing the, the research. Um, was there somewhere else in the state that you had been maybe planning to go before that happened? Um, I, I hadn't really, we hadn't really figured out where to go in the United States, and then those two events happened, and I thought, I thought I needed. I thought I'd cover a tropical storm. I figured I'd go to like you know the Philippines or Indonesia or something like that. And it was quite surprising when, when Harvey happened. And uh, I was actually in Indon I was actually in Tanzania, when the hurricane uh, hit, and I had to fly back um, on short notice. And, and again, I still ended up getting the first chopper. And I was pretty lucky. Um, so it was the U.S. It was that was kind of a happenstance. Um, I actually wanted to go to. A wildlife situation up in Alaska, um, but I couldn't get permission from the uh, from the Fish and Wildlife Service to fly over the wallaces up in Alaska. They really wouldn't allow it. Um, so it was I had a complex. I had, to, I, had to, I had was looking for like the best example in every continent, and um, it was the, the Times left that pretty much up to me where to go. It wasn't like a blank check, uh, but I was pitching them a bunch of ideas, and I, I traveled a lot um, over the years. So, like, I knew Mauritania. I'd been to I had been to those places <coughs> in Mauritania before. It was interesting to go back 20 years later. Um, so it, it was it was complicated. Um, South America was kind of difficult. We couldn't find much. And I went to the Amazon, and one of the reasons they didn't use it in the article was that it was actually a, a, it wasn't an effect of climate change, and they wanted to plant. They didn't use the coal mine in China because that wasn't a co that wasn't an effect either. So it, it was it was kind of uh, complicated. It was. Um, it was kind of a dream gig, and sometimes you you're struggling to find something. I was looking for glaciers in China, and it came. I was doing like Google searches for uh, images about um, uh, glacial loss, and then I came across the, the the trip bridge in Switzerland. And what's really wonderful about that situation was that you had you didn't have to do two pictures. You had it's kind of geeky, but you had this little bridge, and that was kind of like the old water line. So you you had everything in one image. And I was looking for it in China, and I came across. I was kind of obsessed with like you know the the 20th page of the Google image searches, and it's like, oh, oh, it's in Switzerland, it's not in China, and I was in China looking for something, and it was like, no, I don't know. So it, it was, you know, it's kind of like um, some of the best things you look for, you find are, are serendipity, um, and, uh, yeah, and, uh, and then the brain arc, you, you talk to people, like I talked to, um, so for a while situation, people said penguins were getting hammered, and so I talked to some Penguinologist, there's actually a guy who has a penguinologist in his cart. And I talked to a <laughs> penguinologist at Oxford, and he said, Oh, you want to go to peng see penguins? The biggest colony is like Deception Island, and it's a black sand volcanic beach. And if you get there really early, it's all like this. And it's like, Ooh. And I talked to some of the other, like, uh, some other wildlife guys I know at the Geographic, and said, Oh, yeah, you want penguins, you got to go to Deception Island. 
And then you call and they say, well, but do you want to go there? You, you got to have your own boat. And then the boats are five grand a day. A and, and, and so I ended up on a sailboat and it took 20 days to get that picture. <laughs> and I'm really, I'm really incredibly grateful to the Pulitzer <laughs> Center and the Times that I spent a lot of time on pictures. I worked once for the Geographic, I spent like a week in a picture. I never spent th three weeks in a picture. Um, and a lot of vomiting going across the Great Passage. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was a great picture. <laughs> At least I thought it was a great picture. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, so it was, yeah, it's, it's a lot of hard work and, 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 uh, and happenstance. And let's see, one more question here. Uh, let's see, let's go right back there. Uh, right, yeah, you. If you could just raise your hand so they can get you a. Hi. Um, this is mostly a question for Nathaniel, but also um, any of you who wanted to, who want to comment on um, receptions uh, to the piece. Particularly, I'm interested in, um, Nathaniel, the people who you interviewed, um, you, you know, you're the, the 100 plus interviewers or interviewees, um, how many of them kind of grasped the significance of the topic that they were engaged with while at the time and their reflections now um, as it's, um, you know, probably become more clear to them. Um, and, you know, if you could comment on like some of the environmental activist perspectives versus some of the science scientists' perspectives. <coughs> Um, and their kind of state of being um, when, when you interviewed them. Yeah, well, it was very scary doing the piece because we sort of settled on generally what the premise was going to be uh, after some amount of research, but then I actually started to interview people and I was prepared for them to tell me, you know, that everything was wrong. That's usually what happens when I report stories. And it happened uh, to some extent. Um, with this piece, I mean, for instance, I originally planned on having there be a much stronger, have a full industry narrative over the decade. And I didn't think necessarily that there would be one character, but I thought I could string it together through a series of characters. Um, but there just wasn't enough to go on. I spent months trying to, to do that. But, um, you know, so I had to abandon a few things. Uh, but, but generally, <clears throat> the response from people were, who were involved intimately uh, during this period were, um, I'm so glad you're telling this story. Nobody talks about what we were doing then. Um, I'm so glad you're focusing on Rafe Pomerantz. It's like everybody loves Rafe Pomerantz. Um, and he's, he's someone who's always been behind the scenes, very purposefully, very modest. Um, and there's some things in the piece even, like that, that he came up with, for instance, this major number uh, that was put forward in, in uh, in Toronto that you know the world needs to reduce carbon emissions by 20 percent by in, by 2000 it took until like the last week of fact checking for him to admit that he it was that was his number that he just like blurted it out in a meeting and it got adopted so he's very modest um, <coughs> which made things very difficult sometimes to report but uh, no generally <coughs> they basically uh, all told me the same thing which is that uh, you know, the, every, people were engaged at the highest levels of the government during this period, uh, that there were major figures within the Republican Party, within Congress, there were major people within the Carter White House, um, you had William Riley in the, in the Bush White House, all working to get this thing done. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's all in the piece, they, they, but there wasn't a lot of, and since the piece I've, uh, <clears throat> I've generally, I've received a very warm, you know, letters from those people I interviewed, um, and uh, yeah. I think this was especially a poignant piece of reporting for people of kind of my generation, 60s and up maybe, who, who live, and I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people in the last month that, that were like me, either journalists or in policy or law or whatever, but they lived through this and they, and they actually remember a lot, a lot of these things that Nathaniel brought back to life, the kinds of the, the questions, the debates, the negotiations that went on. They kind of lived through that as professionals in our, in our careers and, and to look back now and see what was missed and, and the, you know, the chasm that has opened up since then where there's not even really the opportunity to kind of talk. I mean, back then, you still were engaged across the political lines, party lines, as yeah. you are now. And the closing of the ranks with the oil and gas industry right at the end of the decade, and then this, a sense of total impossibility flooding 
then um, into the 90s. I mean, the other <coughs> thing that's interesting is even people who follow the issue uh, somewhat closely think that this all started with Jim Hansen's testimony in 1988. Uh, but there's almost a century of history leading up to that moment. Uh, so I think a lot of people in, in involved during this earlier period feel vindicated that the story is being told. So I just <coughs> want to thank both of them for uh, pointing out for our enterprising uh, student researchers, perhaps some journalists, photographers, et cetera, that as fancy and as beautiful and as perfect as this looks, you will spend months going down cul-de-sacs and uh, yeah. <laughs> you know wrong directions, and there may even be some protracted vomiting involved. <laughs> so, On uh, bo both of us, yeah. Both of <laughs> <laughs> okay. So with that, thank you all for coming, and for those of us who watched us online, um, we're gonna be hosting a series of exciting events on that YouTube channel, so please subscribe. Uh, I also really wanna make a quick, uh, really important shout out to the great team that uh, is required to put an event like this together, uh, and a big thank you to our staff that helped do that, in particular Eric Fine, Lisa Fernandez, and Lori Bazzuto of our team. Uh, just thank you so much. <laughs> and finally, just uh, join me in thanking John, Nathaniel, and George for coming today. And we'll have a reception right afterwards. Thanks for bringing Tony. <laughs> Tony. Yeah. Get the old guy out. You coming up? Brother Anthony, Tony. Yes. Great pleasure to meet you. Nice Thanks so much for yeah. coming. Yeah, well, I, it's, I was involved in this stuff back in 1970s. Yeah. Uh, back in the late 1960s.